Ben Fortunapuna, Mr. Winston Dukaran, and the Brahma Kumaris Raj Yoga Center for St. Augustine, I'd like to cordially welcome each and every one to our discussion this evening entitled Beyond the Higgs Particle, a huge discovery that may affect our lives in the future. I am Vito Amrup, and it's my pleasure to be the chair for this afternoon's proceedings. Before we start, we would like to engage in a bit of meditation to put everyone into the right frame of mind as we get into the wonderful topic we have in store for you. And to take us through our initial meditation, I'd like to call on Sister Vishanti at this point in time. And from that point, experience the pure energy of the self emanating light, the supreme light, like a ray of light encircling us. Vishanti, and I think we're all in a better frame of mind uh, to really accept this discourse this evening. And it is, a, I can't say on the heels, because in 2012, there was a lecture done by Dr. Hack, an astrophysicist at the University of the West Indies, done at the MP's office in Tunapuna. And that lecture was entitled, The God Particle is the smallest subatomic particle that attracts mass. This discovery was made by exciting the Higgs field of Rajasthan, India, and excelled academically from an early age, standing first in the order of merit at the secondary and higher secondary school examinations in the state of Rajasthan, and was awarded gold medals by the state board. He was also selected for the national scholarship, which is awarded to very few students. In 1973, he joined the University of Rajasthan for his higher studies. He completed his Bachelor of Commerce in 1976 and Master's in Management in 1978. Once again, he stood first in the order of merit at the university and was awarded gold medals, both at the Bachelor of Com Commerce and the MBA examination. Soon after Master's in Management, Mr. Gupta served in the banking sector for a period of three years during which time he gained qualification and became a member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. In 1980, he appeared for the civil, Indian Civil Services examinations and was selected for the Indian Foreign Service in July 1981. As part of his earlier diplomatic assignments, Mr. Gupta served in Indian missions in Belgium, Bangladesh, and Bahrain. During his posting in Delhi, he served in the economic and finance divisions of the Ministry of External Affairs as Deputy Secretary. Subsequently, Mr. Gupta served as Deputy Chief of Mission in the Indian Embassy in Mexico and as Deputy Permanent Delegate of India to UNESCO in Paris. He served as Minister, Embassy of India, Manila from January 2001 to April 2003 as Ambassador of India to Mongolia from June 2003 till September 2006. From October 2006 to February 2010, Mr. Gupta served as Head of Administration in the Ministry of Foreign External Affairs of India. His Excellency served as Ambassador of India in Budapest from April 2010 to August 2013. During this period, he was also ambassador of India to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Since October 2013, we are privileged to have Mr. Gupta to serve us as the High Commissioner of India to Trinidad and Tobago, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Montserrat, and Grenada. Now, this is the interesting part. Mr. Gupta is also a writer and a poet. In 2007, his book entitled Mongolia the Land of Blue Skies was published, and in 2008, his book, Droplets, a compilation of English poetry, was published. His next publication came out in 2010 in the form of a collection of Hindi poetry titled Chand Lamhe. His fourth book, entitled Unraveling Mysteries of Life, 
Modern Science and Ancient Wisdom was published in 2012, both in English and Hungarian. This book is based on extensive research on fundamental issues of human life, both from the perspective of modern science and ancient wisdom. The book has received extremely good reviews and is being translated in Hindi, Czech, and Romanian languages, and I understand soon in German. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our main feature speaker today, Our Excellency, Mr. Gupta. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vido Ramroop. At the very outset, let me express my sincere thanks to His Excellency, Mr. Winston Dukaran, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Trinidad and Tobago, and a, of course the Member of Parliament and also a very prominent politician of the country for organizing this uh, get-together today. I am grateful to him despite his uh, eye surgery in the last few days he has been uh, able to come and join us this afternoon. Thank you very much sir. Thank you. And I'm thankful to Sister Hemdata for providing the venue. Uh, she is always very generous and helpful. And uh, we have been using her generosity once a while in many parts of the country. Thank you very much, Sister Hemdata. And thanks to all of you for coming in uh, large number to listen to this subject, which is uh, not of ordinary interest, because ordinary people don't take interest in this, these issues that much. But this is a subject which is very fascinating and uh, I hope uh, you would like it and I would like to know your views at the end of my talk. So thank you very much and let us uh, start with the subject now. Beyond the Higgs particle. You know the mysteries of life have fascinated humanity since times immemorial. We our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors all wanted to know who we are, why have we come here, what is the mission of the life, what happens when we die, where do we go, what is this vast universe, these millions of stars and planets and galaxies and how they run, who runs them what is this various forms of life you know you have millions of lives you go to underworld for example variety of fishes you go in the sky you have variety of birds you go on the earth in a forest you find large number of animals there are variety of insects how they are born who sustains them how come they are able to reproduce all these questions have fascinating, fascinated humanity since times immemorial. We have all been trying to find answers to these questions time and again. And so is the modern science. The science has also been trying to find answers to these questions. Now just to tell a little bit about modern science, one thing which you must keep in mind is that Scientific theories have undergone drastic changes and revision over time. If you recall in 15th century, the life of the earth was ascertained at 6,000 years only because it was based on something written in Bible, the 2,000 year before the birth of Jesus Christ. And then the whole thing was transformed and today the scientists believe that the life of earth could be somewhere 4.3 billion years. So you see the, the, the radical change in the, in the scientific theories. This is not the only one, there are many others. Once upon a time, earth was supposed to be the center. All other planets were supposed to be revolving around the earth. And now we all believe that sun is the center of the solar system and all the planets revolve around it. So things have evolved and they are evolving and they will continue to evolve. 
In this context, there are three important discoveries of science which are considered landmark discoveries and I would like to refer to them one by one. One is called Big Bang Theory. Now Big Bang Theory basically explains to us that how this universe came into being. They say that there was a corpuscle of energy in a concentrated form which somehow exploded and then it keep expanding, expanding and a variety of galaxies and planets and stars came into being as a result of that explosion and expansion over billions of years. That is now estimated into several billion, perhaps 13.7 billion, some say, some say even more. So that is one theory which has been talked about and which is still considered the most authentic explanation on the existence of this universe. <coughs> I won't have time to go into the precise details, but I just want to refer to them. The second theory is the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin, which said that there was a single cell which came into existence, then they started multiplying, and through multiplication and through what he calls survival of the fittest system, the multicell orgasm came into being, and then those multicell orgasm developed <coughs> from the lower orgasm to higher orgasm and that ultimately led to the development of a human being. That is the theory of evolution, which is survival of the fittest from single cell to multiple cells and from uh, single, what you call, organism to multiple organisms. Like in our body, we have so many organisms today. We have a respiratory system, we have digestive system, we have and uh, the circulatory system. So there are various systems which are actually called organism in the scientific sense. So these are the two important theories and the third theory is now which is called the Higgs particle. If you look at the origin of the universe, the Big Bang theory says that it was a corpuscle of energy which exploded and developed into the, what we call the universe today. Now, energy is made of photon. Photon is a particle of light. Photon doesn't have weight. It doesn't have mass. The sun rays coming from the sun are photons. It doesn't have mass. It doesn't have weight. So the question arises, how did mass and weight came into being? Because if it was a corpuscle of energy, pure energy, which is basically photon, how that photon produced mass, which developed into these planets and water and, you know, heavier things, as we call them. So this research has been going on, and this theory which uh, Vido just explained was discovered in 2012. Uh, in fact, the theory was propounded in, uh, in 1960s. But then it was scientifically recognized by uh, the, the laboratory, the European Research Laboratory in 2012. And the scientists who propounded this theory in 1960s, they were given Nobel Award prizes uh, in 2012 after the, uh, the research was confirmed by uh, the European Research Center. Now this theory says, that what they call it Higgs particle. This is a small little particle in the atom which they call it Higgs particle. If the photon or any, uh, any uh, what you call object passes through that particle, it develops, it gains more and more mass. They say once it passes, it gets 40 times more mass. So that theory tries to explain how the mass came into existence. Because if you go on a planet, the mass also decides what we call gravity. The gravity of a planet 
is based on the quantum of mass it contains. Like gravity of moon is less because the mass is less, gravity of earth is higher because mass is more. If you go on the moon, your weight would be reduced substantially because your weight is decided based on the gravity. So these are various complicated factors which come into play. But these are only few factors, you see. Universe is a vast entity. And let us look at it uh, in a few. Now, going briefly over these theories, let's look into uh, the universe, how it is. As per the modern science, the universe, the minimum size of the universe they estimate is 76 billion light years. And what is a light year? The speed at which the light travels in a year. In one second, the light travels approximately 300,000 kilometers. In one second. So in one minute, 60 times, one hour, then again 60 times, then one day, and then one year, you can imagine the enormous distance it can travel in one year. And then 67 billion years, how much it can travel. That is the size of the universe which science is estimating today. And on top of it, this is the size of the universe which is observable within the scientific instruments available with the scientists today. And they say that it is only 4% of the total universe. 96% is not observable because sunlight never reaches there. If sunlight never reaches, you cannot observe anything. <laughs> so 4% of the universe is spread over, over an area of 76 billion light years with millions of galaxies, each galaxy having millions of stars and trillions of planets. The solar system is part of one galaxy which is supposed to have 200 billion uh, suns, 200 billion solar systems in one galaxy alone. So imagine the enormity of this. You see, now what I am explaining, why I am explaining this is the region. Given this enormity of the universe which is understood by us today, still it works very precisely. The sun rises at the time when it should rise. It sets at a time when it should set. The moon changes its phases it's supposed to do. The spring arrives precisely at the time when it's supposed to arrive. If it does not, then we get, you know, a little bit worried about that. The rains come, the winds blow precisely as they are supposed to blow. Hmm? Even we, our lifestyle goes on as it's supposed to go, by and large. Hmm? How this happens? If this is, this whole thing originated accidentally as the Bing Bang theory says, then how do you think it can work so precisely? There has to be a precise mathematics which makes it work. And if you think that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is successful, there are many questions on that. The first question is that how did the first cell originate it to begin with? And how did it get the, the so-called property of multiplying itself? How did it come into being? And if that theory is true, there is no explanation. The scientists say that you give me one first cell and I can explain the biology. But the first cell nobody knows how it came into being till date and how it gave the property of multiplying itself. So you cannot explain. Moreover, if the evolution theory is true, even today we have the smallest insect available and we also have a human being. Then the insect should have evolved as a human being already. Why do the insects still exist? All this millions of variety of life, why do they exist? If they should have evolved already to a higher stage and maybe we will evolve to some other stage later on, if that is true. So, there are a lot of question marks on this. The same question marks apply to the Higgs particle. Now, the Higgs particle which they are talking about, that particle is in addition to the neutron, proton and electron in the atom. And this particle, in fact, 
has some weight in it already. It has some mass. Now, how did that mass come into being? There is no explanation. It multiplies the mass later on, like the cells multiply, the same way it multiplies the mass, but how did the original mass come into being? There is no explanation in the science as yet. So both the questions, the first cell, that is the life existence, and the mass, both are unexplained in the, in the science as of today. Maybe one day they will explain, but as of today it is not explained. It is very clear you can talk to any great scientist, they will reach the same conclusion. I am not a scientist, but I know a little bit because I have studied these subjects. And uh, you can go to the greatest scientist in the world and he will tell you the same thing, that there is no answer to these basic questions. These are even finer questions. We don't even have answer to very simple basic question that whether a man was born first or a woman was born first. Do we have an answer to this question? Can anybody has tell me? Do we have an answer whether egg was born first or chicken was born first? We don't have an answer. So there are a lot of riddles in this universe. And there were no riddles if the universe was straightforward, if there are no mysteries, we would not be wondering about this universe at all. So there are mysteries and there are a lot of riddles involved. So now let us talk how we can find answers to these questions. If you have any questions, please note them down. I'll be happy to take them at the end. How do we explain these mysteries? We don't have to explain. Actually, these mysteries have been explained by our ancestors in great detail. Because all the civilizations have been thinking over these questions for generations and generations. And like us, our predecessors were also intelligent, you see. Don't think that we are the only intelligent being. They were also intelligent. They also tried to find answers and some of them have succeeded in finding the answers. Now, what are the answers? <coughs> I will narrate a few fundamental questions and fundamental, what you call, propositions for your thinking. And if you agree with them, then we will proceed one by one. The first of all, if the universe runs so precisely, there has to be a precision in its running. There has to be a mathematics. You can predict a solar eclipse 10,000 years hence. Hmm? You can pre predict anything in the universe. The movement of everything is fixed. It's all mathematics. So this is one fundamental answer that everything in the universe runs mathematically. There is a precision which is so precise that a slight deviation can endanger the entire uh, species of life. Not only human but all species of life. A simple earthquake which is nothing in the universal sense, you know, if you talk about universe, what is the earthquake? It endangers all species of life. So that is one fundamental supposition. The second thing is that nothing can be created, nothing can be created without consciousness. Now, we are humans, we have consciousness. We can create. You want to create a chair, you think about it, you collect the material, you can create a chair. But this chair cannot be created by this microphone because it doesn't have consciousness. Can a stone create anything? Can a piece of iron create anything? For any creation, you need consciousness. And higher the level of consciousness, the more the creation you can do. An animal also has consciousness, but the layer level is low, and therefore its creation is limited. It can create a small shelter for itself, it can look after the children, it can look for its food, 
but it cannot create an aircraft it cannot create uh, a cellular phone we have higher level of consciousness therefore we can create more but the fundamental truth is that you can create nothing without consciousness consciousness is the prerequisite for any creation you can think you can give me any single example in this universe where something can be created without consciousness any single example it is not possible to find one so this is the second presupposition which because we have been given intellect we should not accept anything blindly we should accept things which we are convinced with that is why if we believe in god the god has given us intellect to think if we believe in him if we don't i'll talk about that also so this is the second proposition the third is that anything which becomes more and more powerful it becomes more and more subtle it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller in sanskrit they call it suksham but in modern science they call it autumn and you break the autumn and you go further down and down down now just to explain this part for example food is necessary for us to eat but food is gross you can see you can touch but people can live without food for 60 days even some maybe even 120 days <laughs> but water is less gross more subtle than food how many days can you live without water obviously 10 days 12 days 15 days not more and what about air when it becomes more subtle you know air is more subtle you can't even see it eh? how many minutes can we live without air as the things become more powerful they become smaller and smaller this is a principle in nature the smallest thing are those which are more and more powerful so these are the physical parts there are parts which are non physical which are so small that we cannot conceive so this is the third presupposition the first is universe must have some mathematical precision which we can observe the second is the consciousness is prerequisite for any creation the third is the as the things become more powerful they become more and more subtle you agree i suppose the number fourth is that every single thing in this universe is first created out of nothing it is created in the form of nothing like if you want to create a chair it must be created in your mind first that is like nothing you see it's not visible it's not sensible without its creation in the mind you cannot create this chair so the first creation is always in the most subtle form which is non sensible form you cannot imagine what i am thinking now because it is so subtle that you, it cannot be understood by your sense organs and therefore the thought process is the first requirement for any creation apart from consciousness i talked about and the last principle the fifth one our sense organs on which we give so much emphasis are not competent enough to understand the subtle existence they can understand the obvious and even that is not perfect but they cannot understand the subtle existence like i cannot understand your thought process right now can i you cannot your sense organs can't even understand your own mind can your mind be seen by your eyes can it be heard by your ears can it be tasted by your tongue no it cannot be can you touch it no you see even mind is higher than sense organs it's already subtle so it is still physical mind is physical remember that so as the things become more and more subtle 
your sense organs are incapable of understanding it. Even in the ordinary sense, a sense organ of a smell of a dog is far better than ours. The dog can follow a smell for kilometers. We cannot. So look at the power of sense organ, the weakness of our sense organ. You can feel the weakness, how weak it is. Hmm? When we see the mountain from the aircraft, it looks differently. When we actually land up there and see it looks so different. So look at our eyes, they are deceptive. Hmm? You cannot have the same view. The sense organ of a child is different than sense organ of an adult. Sense organ of a woman is different than sense organ of a man. So what is the standard sense organ? How do you grasp this world? We try to understand this world with sense organs, isn't it? <laughs> that is what we always do. But we cannot grasp it because sense organs are deceptive. Look at the bird. Some of the birds can fly 10,000 kilometers without any compass, without any GPS. Can we go even <laughs> few hundred kilometers? <laughs> We need so, so many instruments. So look at the sense organ there working. So our sense organs have limitations. <coughs> they can grasp certain things up to a point. They give you a, uh, a partial view of the reality. They don't give you the correct view of reality. They only give you a partial view of the reality. They change, the perception changes with time, with place, with distance, with person, with age, there are so many factors which change the perception. Okay? Now the science is working on the basis of sense organs. Because everything which is done in laboratories must be perceived through sense organs somewhere. Isn't it? Even if you use instruments, but ultimately the analysis is done by the human being who understand that with sense organs and then tries to answer that question. Now, those sense organs which are not perfect, how can you understand the world correctly? That is the question. So, these are five fundamental truths which I wanted to put before you before I explain what this world is all about. If you doubt any one of those five Please let me know later on. Now this truth about this world has been explained in variety of writings. But I am familiar more with the Vedanta writings. I am not talking about uh, the ritualistic part. I am only talk I'm not talking about religion. I am talking about only the truth. Because Ved means truth. And it has also been explained in a lot of Greek writings. And I have studied both of them with some depth, so I can tell you what it is. Now, the fundamental requirement for any creation is consciousness and mind. Consciousness and thinking power are the fundamental requirement for any creation. So there has to be a consciousness and a mind in existence before anything came into being. This is what the wisdom tells us. And this is what all the principal religions tell you, that there is some sort of consciousness, you may give different name to that. I am not concerned whether you call him Jesus Christ or you call him Allah or you call him Ram or you call him Krishna or Brahm, whatever. It doesn't matter. But there is a consciousness and a mind which is in existence which existed before anything existed. Now that has been called in Upanishadic language. Upanishad is what we call the, the Vedanta. The ultimate truth it says that it, they have called it Brahm, but you can give any name to that. You can call any other name, doesn't matter. It depends on the language and the place and the history and culture, what name you give. That existed and it is eternal. That is also Bible says, I think that's also the Quran says, 
that Allah existed, that Jesus Christ or you know the God existed all the time. There was there was no time in the past when God did not exist. If you conceive there was a time that the God did not exist, then you are giving a explanation that time existed before God came into being. So who created that time? Then another God and you can continue to go back in time billions of time without finding an answer to that. So the only explanation is that the universal consciousness and the universal mind existed eternally before anything came into being. And that is what in Upanishads called Brahm. It is based on the language. Why? Because the root is Brihe. Brihe means to expand infinitely. And Brahm means the he expanded infinitely himself or whatever name you call it. So that is how the name has been given. You can, you know, give any other name. Now that mind and that consciousness is the one which ultimately created everything else. Now the theory of creation has been very lucidly explained in Vedanta. There is some reference in Greek theory but not that much detailed. The Greek philosophers have talked about being and becoming. I think uh, some people know being and becoming very well. I think in <laughs> Quran also there is some reference of the superpower and the created. But there is a difference in that. The difference is that when you drive a motorbike for example, you create a motorbike and you have to sit inside to drive it. If you can't sit, you have to create some instrument which can drive it from inside. You cannot drive it from outside. So when the God created this universe, he, he cannot drive it from outside, you see. He has to sit inside everything to drive it. Otherwise, how do you drive it? That is why in, uh, in Indian Vedanta, this is called Antaryami. You have to sit inside everything. Everything, he exists inside. So he exists in an ant and he also exists in an elephant and he also exists in a human being. Because that consciousness, universal consciousness, is so subtle that it can exist in any form anywhere. That's why they say that every single particle of this universe, God exists. And that is actually the God particle, not the Higgs particle. Higgs particle is not actually the Higgs particle. The scientists came out say good damn particle, and then it was somebody wrote good particle. So it's not really good particle. The consciousness is the first element which existed, and this is what led to. Now that consciousness thought to create something, and then the whole creation started. In in Vedanta, they say that he first created Mahat Tattva. The the, the first mass, which is the most subtle of mass, was Mahat Tattva. It was created. From that, the space was, the Akash, that the word used, space was created. Now, look at the space. You can't imagine the power of space. You know, you can't even define this. Science today cannot define space. They only say what exists between this wall and that wall is space. Between the two physical, what exists between moon and sun is a space. But they don't know what the space is. Can you imagine the power of space? It's, it has nothing. This, this place has nothing, isn't it? That's what a space is, it has nothing. But you cannot believe. It has everything which you can imagine this universe, this, this empty space. How? The first you have, it has the air which you breathe in and out, isn't it? It's so sensible that it gives you oxygen and takes away the carbon dioxide. All the sound which you are listening which passes through this space, isn't it? Hmm? How it transmits. Otherwise you will not be able to hear anything. If you put thousand cell phones here, every cell phone will get its sound. How? Well, there is some discriminatory power in this space which enables it to happen. There is humidity here, so there is water. Hmm? The clouds move into the space. There is water. If there is no water, you will start having problems immediately. Some humidity has to be there. Eh? And not only that, 
I tell sometimes that you destroy a hundred story building, you destroy a big city, it's gone as fire. What happens? Only small little pile is left on the ground, rest has all disappeared into this empty space. It, it converted into gases and disappeared. Where? In this space. Everything disappears into this space. You, if it disappears, everything has to be created from that space also. And this is also true. You have a farmland. You cultivate every year, say, 10,000 acre, 10,000 tons of wheat from that farmland. It has been cultivating for hundreds of years. The farmland is agitated. How it comes? That wheat comes from where? The wheat, the mass. We are talking about the mass. Where it comes from? We call it what we call photosynthesis. It takes the air, it takes the water, it takes earth. But actually there is hardly anything it takes. It's only the process. It takes nothing. Everything comes from this empty space. When you look at the final product, there is hardly any water content. If you take that weight and you calculate the components of everything else, nothing is there. Even if our own body, same thing. So the mass is created out of nothing, out of this space. This is the real creation, not the Higgs particle. So this space can create anything, this space can absorb anything. Everything ultimately disappears into space. This is the theatre of entire universe. Nothing can exist in, without the space. If moon exists and earth exists and sun exists, it's because of the space. If we exist because of the space. So this is the theatre. But this is also the uh, player. The space is also the player. Everything is created from the space and everything disappears into space. So the order of the creation age, which is explained age, that first the Mahatattva was created. That is the first uh, uh, subtle element which had some, I don't know what kind of fraction of weight which was created by that consciousness, universal consciousness, which existed eternally. And from there the space was created, expanded, like Brahm expanded infinitely. A space was created. Wherever there is space, there is wind, air, not wind, air. The air came out of space. The creation of air is from the space. And from the air, water was created. Eh, sorry, fire was created. From the air, fire was created. From the fire, water. From the water, earth. It, the creation goes from very light, very small to the solid ones. That's how the particles, the weight and the mass is built up. Now how it is, I'll explain <coughs> a little bit. Because it's very scientific. It's totally mathematical. There's nothing which you cannot understand about this. There is only one property of a space, that is the property of sound. There is no other property in a space, because you cannot explain this except the sound, sound travels. And this property of sound, because human being is connected to this space, it is a scientific creation, it is not random creation. Everything is science in this universe, everything is mathematics. So we also have five senses, there are five elements of the creation, that the space, air, fire, water and earth. We also have five senses, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of sight, the sense of uh, uh, taste and the sense of smell. We also have five senses of action, they are also linked. And we also have five fingers, they are also, they all, everything is science here. Everything is mathematics. There is nothing without that. So our, the creation, when the creator created the space, he created the sense of hearing for us. These are linked. Sense of hearing and the space are linked. When the air was created from the space, the sense of touch was created in our body. When the air touches, you feel this touch. That, that there is most subtle touch we can feel. From the air, the fire was created. With fire, your sight, the sense of sight was created. Because 
as soon as the sun goes down or the light comes down you cannot see it's all linked together hmm? and then all the tests all the tests come from water water has this, the sense of uh, taste which is linked to our sense of taste and the earth has sense of a smell which is linked to our sense of a smell now how the weight has been added is also scientific because the space only has one attribute that is the sense of hearing sense of sound or hearing the other way around but the second creation which is air it has two attributes the first it takes from the space that is the sense of sound and secondly its own attribute which is the sense of touch so it has two it has already become heavier then the fire which is the third creation it has three senses first it comes from the space the sense of is sound the second the sense of touch which comes from the air and the third its own sense its own uh, attribute which is the sight or light and similarly the fourth creation the water has four attributes these three plus its own attribute of taste all tastes originate in water you cannot feel any taste unless there is water in that substance and then the earth which is the heaviest it has all the five attributes it has the sense of uh, sound the sense of touch the sense of sight the sense of taste and the sense of smell and this is the heaviest and you can see all the five senses there so this is the way the creation moves and this is the way we move this is also partially uh, uh, verified by the science and certified in a way when i was a student we used to study that once upon a time the earth was a ball of gas eh? and then it turned into a water and froze and then the earth came up i'm sure that same theory still continues so the gas turned into water water turned into earth so part of this is already confirmed by the modern science and rest will be confirmed in course of time when the science becomes more developed so this is the physical creation which you're talking about the mass the the we we beyond higgs particle this is how the physical creation has happened in the physical creation let me just summarize that for any creation there has to be a consciousness there has to be a mind first it is created in non physical form in the mind and then it was created in the physical form in the order i just explained to you mahatat then the space and then the air and then the fire and then the water and then the earth this is the way when it is dissolved it dissolves into reverse order the earth dissolves into water water dissolves into fire fire dissolves into air and air dissolves back into space this is the way you try any element on this earth you it will dissolve in the same way you take a piece of metal you put it on temperature the first <laughs> it will melt and become liquid then you keep heating it up it will turn into gaseous form and it will disappear into the space this is the order everything disappears and everything is created so this is the physical part now i'll go little bit on beyond the topic and uh, 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 the consciousness part the the living creatures because higgs particle touches only on the mass not on the uh, the consciousness the the species of life no now a species of life how that comes into being that has been very beautifully explained that every single species of life has two elements one element is the physical element which comes from these five elements i just talked about it has all the five elements every single species of life has these five elements we also have that five elements 
space, air, fire, water and earth. Every single species and ant also has it. This is what we call, it's called as Aparashakti in Upanishads. Aparashakti is the external or inferior energy of the Almighty. Because this physical creation comes from the inferior uh, energy of the Almighty. Then the consciousness. How the consciousness comes? The consciousness comes from what they call it Parashakti. The internal energy of the Almighty. Or of the universal consciousness. Which gives that consciousness to each one of the species of life. And the two make together creates all this existence. All this existence come into being with the two together. But the, the physical element exists only as long as the consciousness is there. As soon as the consciousness leaves, the physical part disappears as well. Like as soon as the consciousness leaves us, our body cannot sustain, it will go back to the five elements it came from. Same happens to an ant or an elephant or anything else. So that consciousness keeps that physical body together. The physical, physical body cannot be kept together without consciousness. That is a precondition of uh, life forms. And that applies to all kinds of life forms. In Vedic writings, they have called that there are 8.4 million forms of life. 8.4 million forms of life which exist in the water, in the air, on the earth. Now, I don't know, there would be a time when science will be able to discover how many forms of life are there. But as of today, we don't know. And I always tell that through the physical route, how many billions of stars can you discover? Till today you have landed upon uh, only two planets, that is the moon and the Mars. But there are trillions of such planets all around. Uh, we are not, we can't even cross our own galaxy, our own solar system. Even if I have a life of a billion year, I cannot cross that. It's not possible. The physical route, you cannot do that. Because physical route has limitations. And therefore, the science has limitations. As long as science depends on the physical root, firstly, physical root involves sense organs, and everything cannot be perceived through sense organs, as I explained to you. And secondly, the physical root takes you to billions of different uh, planets and creations in this world. How will you explain? You can't even explain the, uh, the properties of an ant till date. Can you explain the property of an ant? Can science explain it? They cannot. We can't even count the hair on our body. You forget about anything else. This is physical counting. Nobody can count them. Tell the science, can they count and tell you? Physical route, you cannot explain these things. These things have to be done through meditation, through raising the level of consciousness inside the body. As the animal cannot understand certain things as human being we can. Similarly, if you raise your consciousness, you can understand certain things much better. It's a very simple thing. You work in a factory. A worker who is involved in a particular machine, for him that machine is everything, you see. But for a manager of the factory, he has to think more widely about the whole factory. So his consciousness, his vision changes completely. For him the machine is important, but everything else is also important. So as soon as you rise up and up, your vision changes. The same thing happens as your consciousness goes up, your vision will change. Your thinking process will change. And that is what we need to do. We should not believe anything blindly any time in life. We have been invested. The God has given us consciousness. God has given us mind. God has given us intellect to think and to understand. So we should try to understand things properly and if we are convinced then we should accept them and that is what I wanted to talk and thank you very much for your patience for your hearing and I'll be happy to answer any questions
Thank you very much, Mr. Gupta. I think this has been very thought-provoking, and I was sitting here just thinking of so many things, and I'm certain each one of us, in our own way, in our own personal lives, would be thinking of our own experiences and reflecting on what was said. I was looking at Mr. Dukaran, and I could just imagine his thought processes and how they were going off. And it brings me to a quote that he gave, and I remember that this was at the 2012 session with Dr. Huck. And I would like to quote Mr. Dukaran. He said, religion is based on faith. Science is based on proof. Politics is based on neither. <laughs> Spirituality based on higher consciousness. Correct. <laughs> you can add to that. <laughs> and, and this is exactly what I was going to get to, where your last comment in terms of as people's role changes, their consciousness needs to change. And I thought, what a wonderful quote. Almost two years ago, and now we have the follow-on to that in terms of really raising the level of consciousness in the politics. <laughs> So with that, I know we will have our questions and so on, but we want to hear from Mr. Dukaran, and then we'll take the, the questions after. All right, so analytics. But the role that Mr. Dukaran has to play and has played, even though it may not be physically visible to a lot of people, but he has, in fact, encouraged a certain type of thinking among a lot of people, a whole new generation of thinking, and that is creating the genesis for change that will come. So I dare say that even though Mr. Dukaran is in his elderly age, he still has a major role to play in the politics and life of Trinidad and Tobago. And I will introduce you to Mr. Dukaran for us to hear some of his wisdom. Thank you very much, Vidwan. To some extent, you are raising my consciousness. I want to say, like all who are here today, what a wonderful experience this is to have His Excellency, the High Commissioner of India, give us what really is an exceptional, well-articulated and a logical discourse on what really are some very deep and fundamental issues below the surface in life. And I want to thank you so much, Your Excellency, for accepting this invitation of the Office of the Member of Parliament. And in that respect, I want to say a word of appreciation from the staff for your being here today and being so erudite in your presentation. I also want to say very briefly that Sister Hemlata has been a source of inspiration for all of Trinidad and Tobago. I know a bit of her early beginnings here, and I have had the opportunity over the many years to walk now and then in the journey of the Brahma Kumaris and the Raj Yoga organization here in Trinidad and Tobago. And I always wonder in my mind what kind of consciousness will cause a medical doctor and others in that grouping to devote their entire life in what could sometimes be a journey in which there is only frustration, raising the consciousness of people. But I looked at her when His Excellency was given his discourse and I saw a small smile came on her when he said, Your Excellency, when you said that it is consciousness and the mind that requires meditation in order to perfect the art of discovery. So today we are, and I want to thank you, Sister Mlata, for all you have done for us in this country and elsewhere. But today we have had an extraordinary event, moving on from the lecture we had from Dr. Huck some time ago, 
but into a different sphere. I myself listened very attentively to what you have said, and I cannot comprehend or be able to say to you that I can put all you have said together because you have given us some deep insights, some deep insights into the universe and what is the universe. And so often we tend to think that our life is here and now, but the way you have put the perspective in place, you have taught us that life is way beyond today and now. And the description of the universe itself was a tremendous inspiration for those of us who sometimes condemned ourselves to the daily affairs of life, as if that is all life is about. And I want to say that you have been able, in your discourse, to give us so many insights, and I have no doubt that this will become something that the entire community would be delighted to have shared in your insights. No doubt, you are not only a diplomat, you are indeed a philosopher. But what you told me earlier on, as we walked together to join this platform, when I told you that I believe and I sense that spirituality and science is now becoming a new demands on the search for knowledge in the world and in Trinidad and Tobago. And you replied, you said spirituality is a higher level of science. And I reflected on that and as you spoke here today, I began to understand what you meant by saying spirituality is a higher sense of science. For we have become so often to accept that science is the ultimate in the world of knowledge. But you have shown us in your discourse here today that science is important and the logic that science brings to bear is important. But beyond that, there is a spirituality as some of us call it and you have sometimes referred to it as a consciousness. I was particularly taken by your focus on consciousness and that consciousness, if it does not rise to the level that human potential can have, may lead us to inaction. And you also said that in this universe we must drive it from within. Those are deep thoughts that we cannot expect the consciousness to be driven from outside. I know that there are experts here, and I know there are many, and I appreciate the presence of so many individuals here that have come to listen to this discourse on consciousness. If there is indeed a low level of consciousness, then there will be a low level of action. And as a politician, I will say, if there is a low level of consciousness, there will be a low level of political action. And I think this is something that we as a society must ponder upon now. Ponder upon now because we may be shortchanging ourselves and our potential may never be realized if we operate on a level of consciousness that is not deep, that is not scientifically based on logic, that is not based on a sense of reality in terms of the logic in which this universe operates. So I pondered. I pondered for a moment as you spoke. And I pondered to the relevance of what you have said to our own climate here in Trinidad and Tobago. And although you were very clear in linking what you said in a universal context. Here, we must give great thought to the consciousness with which we operate. This is not for today. This is not even for tomorrow. 
Certainly it's not for yesterday. It is that consciousness that you speak about that will in fact create with the drivers coming something that we can achieve in the future. So today I believe your message as a politician much more than anything else here today is that we must raise our consciousness of our potential and that that consciousness must reflect itself in our political consciousness for it is true that we can have higher levels of political action. I know the audience here was enthralled by what you have said and I want to say the manner in which you presented this discourse today also is worthy of a great commendation. For you were yourself an expression of the logic of which you spoke about and the arguments that you put forth were done in such a sequential way that I saw in the audience, and you did say, general audiences are normally not enthralled by such discourse. But I want to say I sense, and I looked at the faces, and I looked at those eyes that are here, and one of the great talents or skills of a politician is to look at the eyes and see whether they'll vote for you or not. <laughs> and I will tell you, looking at the eyes here, you have the vote of this entire group in. Thank you so much for what you have done here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ducker, and always one to get those sharp comments in that really, you know, lands where it is tended to. At this point in time, I'd just like to acknowledge some members in our audience. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Brinsley Samaru from the university and well-known historian in Trinidad. Thank you very much. Mr. Anthony Sami, former chairman of the Digger Martin Regional Corporation, and I know he's visited here at the center and been witness to some other discourses in the past. And Mr. Esmond Ford, vice chairman of the Tunapuna Piaka Regional Corporation and counselor for the Orsonville Tunapuna and candidate in the upcoming general election. Thank you very much for being part of this audience here today. At this point in time, we'll now take questions from the audience. As Mr. Dukran pointed out, this was such an enthralling discourse by Mr. Gupta that I'm certain that we would have some questions, clarification, things that you may be thinking about that you said, you know, this is having me thinking. Now is the time so you wouldn't go home thinking, you know, I wish I had asked that question. We could see we have a vessel of knowledge that we need to capitalize on. And that's why I said earlier that we in Trinidad are so fortunate to have as our ambassador from India, someone in, in, in the person of Mr. Gupta. So without further ado, we now open up the floor for questions, comments, and so on. Right, I, Mr. Chairman, I have, I have two questions, um, and I, I will, I'll give you the two questions now, and you could answer them now or later on. First of all, in a lot of the literature that we read, uh, what you're talking about, the Higgs theory, a lot of the literature talks about the Higgs boson theory. And, and the argument is that it's an Indian scientist, Bose, who cooperated with Higgs to create this theory. But in your entire discourse, you didn't for one one occasion even mentioned boson, why it was called the Higgs boson theory. But that is the, the, the less important question. The more important question is that you give a very scientific and logical mathematical explanation of the creation of the universe. Um, but, but let us say that about 10% of the population of the world has that kind of consciousness to understand what you said today, or to follow that kind of logic. 90% of human beings give theological explanations, religious explanations. And you said today that you are not too concerned about religion, you're not too concerned about theology, you're concerned more about science. So there is a dichotomy, there is a contradiction 
on the one hand and you're giving this scientific mathematical explanation what the majority of the world's population trying to explain some of these very questions theologically so what I would like you to do is to try to harmonize or give some kind of rationale for this enormous dichotomy from your approach to the predominant theological approach. Should we go one by one? Yes. Okay. Yes, Hicks Bhujam has been mentioned in most of the writings and you have given the right explanation. I didn't want to go into the details because it might raise the question that I'm preferring Indian scientists over the Western. So that is a debate which is not called for at this moment. The fundamental uh, question was whether we can explore and understand the universe, the physical universe, through physical route, through scientific experiments and through sense organs, which I try to explain that it is not possible because it gives you only partial explanation but not the complete truth. So that is one part. The second is religion versus truth. <coughs> the truth can be experienced by each one of us as we raise the level of consciousness. Religion in to some extent in fact, the initial phases of the religion were designed to explain you the truth. Initial phases. But then the blind following by the subsequent generations and then converting the initial thoughts into words which cannot be challenged at later stage created this problem. And this is not the problem of the original person who gave the thoughts. It is the problem of the power structures which were created by the human race afterwards. That my religion is more you know, powerful than your religion, I am more follower than you do. That created the problem of these power structures and that actually prevents us from learning the truth. But I am telling you there is a new thinking now in the world because I have traveled around the world in many universities delivering talks on these issues and I get a feeling that people now are fed up with orthodox form of religion. They want to look for the correct explanation, the truthful explanation of the uh, mysteries of the life. And I hope I am right, but it will obviously take a lot of time to change the human race in such a large way and perhaps it is designed that we should not all change because otherwise the world will also not be able to run. So there is another element which I have not talked today why the world is running. That is another element why we are, you know, if we all realize the truth and we disassociate ourselves with the functioning of the world, the world will also stop. So there is a reason for that but that is a different topic. I can talk on that topic separately some other day the universe was sound and secondly did you say is only sound could pass through the universe space. through um, through space and um, space, only attribute of a space is sound right and the other thing uh, I just want a little comment from you did the pharaohs have it correct three and a half thousand BC when they were preparing for the afterlife in the sense you say everything disperses up into the space. And what are your concepts about there and the afterlife preparing for it as regards matter and antimatter? Do you think if we follow the lives of the pharaohs that they may have it correct in which they have this afterlife where they form back and they live in their own what nirvana or so? So far as the attribute or properties of the five elements are concerned, the property of a space is sound. And as I told, it is linked with our sense of hearing. That's the only property. The property of air are two, touch and sound, which comes from the previous one. So this is what I explained about the space. 
The second part is about pharaohs. You see, the consciousness is eternal, it never dies. That is what has been explained in many spiritual writings around the world. Because it has no origin, it has no beginning and therefore it has no end. Anything which has beginning has to have an end. Anything which has no beginning cannot have its an end. The consciousness ever exists. We exist as long as consciousness exists in us. Our body dissolves into the nature as soon as the consciousness leaves us. But that living consciousness still exists in the space. It merges with the rest of the consciousness in the space. Like you keep air in a balloon, as soon as the balloon bursts, it merges, the air merges into the air into the space. The tire bursts, the air comes back to the space, same way. The water, wherever you put it, will try to go to the ocean. That is the final objective of any drop of water in any form, whether it's a glacier or river or lake or anywhere, want to reach the ocean. The same way the consciousness once released from the body, it merges into the universal consciousness and it exists there eternally. And then the rebirth takes place. That is another theory because every action in the universe has a reaction and particularly human actions because human being has been given a higher level of consciousness so we can think and we can decide what we want to do. That privilege does not exist with other species of life. This privilege is given only to human race. A, a, an animal just follows the routine things, only works for the food and shelter and uh, recreation and you know children, that's it. That is what uh, their life is. But we have the power to think, power to decide and we choose our actions. And therefore those actions have reactions and those reactions fructify in the form of a seed which comes into your next birth. But that's a different, uh, you know, matter for a different lecture. So I can't, I won't like to go into the complete detail of that today. Of his consciousness. Would you agree? That a person's individual difference is based only on the person's level of consciousness. No, no. Let me, let me explain this. I explained we have five senses and five fingers and five elements. The consciousness also exists at five different levels. They are called in Vedic writings, they are very clearly defined. The lowest level of consciousness is called mineral regime. Mineral regime means like the stones and minerals and earth, they also have, this wood also has consciousness because it decays with time. If you keep it somewhere after a while it will disappear. So it has a level of consciousness which is very low, which cannot be observed and seen properly, which is called mineral regime. The second higher level is called plant regime. The plants and herbs have consciousness which is higher than the mineral consciousness, you can see them grow, but they cannot move, they cannot talk, but they grow, they give you fruit, they give you flowers, so that is a higher level of consciousness. The third higher level is animal regime. Animal regime is even higher because they can move, they can talk, they can, you know, perhaps talk among themselves, their understanding is better than plant regime, so that the third level of consciousness. The fourth level of consciousness is us, the human race. We have higher level of consciousness compared to the animal regime. Therefore, we can think, we can create. We are also the second greatest creator in the world after the, uh, the so-called almighty creator. Eh? And the fifth level of consciousness is the universal consciousness or the creator or almighty, whatever you call it. But that is not existing separately that is existing in the every single particle of the universe. Every single particle has that, uh, that you know, 
consciousness and that is why it is called universal consciousness so these are the five layers of consciousness in general but when you talk about only human differences human beings among themselves have various levels of consciousness as well that is one region of difference okay but there is another region of difference comes from their body the body matters when it comes to it let me give you an example of electricity and you know how it works you have electricity you connect to the fan it gives you air you collect it connect it to a bulb it gives you light you connect it to a refrigerator it cools it is the same electricity but depending on the equipment the outcome is changing the same way depending upon the construction of our body the outcome of the consciousness will change the body affects the consciousness the body limits the consciousness it it's a different you know it will require a lot of explanation to tell you how the body is affected and how body affects the consciousness but you will realize that each one of us even if we have the same level of consciousness the plant for example uh, a seed of mango will only give you a mango and the leaves will be different and the flower will be different the tree would be different but another seed of lemon will give you a different plant though they are taking the same elements from the nature the same photosynthesis uh, process is being performed there they are taking the same amount of consciousness but the functions differ depending on the seed the same thing depends on the body our body affects our consciousness therefore the body affects the consciousness how we react like the fan gives a different outcome and a refrigerator gives a different outcome for the same electricity but the electricity uh, intensity can also differ it can be 100 watt or 60 watt or 40 watt that will also make a difference so there are layers layers everywhere we can talk about this separately thank you right, right. just one just one small question again so um you're talking about how we how we see the universe how we how we are uh, experience the universe are we saying too at the same time that each one of us will see the universe in a different way depending on the level of consciousness that we have you are a universe yourself everything which exists in the universe is within you the universe consists of five elements you have those five elements within you the universe has consciousness you have that consciousness within you the universal consciousness has a mind you have that mind within you so entire universe exists inside you in a miniature form like a drop of water has the same properties at the ocean of water but it cannot become ocean remember that though the properties are the same the drop will be dropped ocean will be same uh, ocean will be ocean the same way we represent the universe we are a miniature universe in ourselves but we cannot become universe that is the difference okay. this is just the beginning i think as we all go in our own private domain there will be a lot of reflections and i would reflect and that has been the dilemma for quite a while where we all seem to want something better but how that is achieved has been very difficult to come by and i think this discourse here really gives a good indication as to where that genesis has to be it must come from each and every one of us but knowledge is mission as to the articles documents he would have published books and so on that we can avail ourselves and share this with people family members friends colleagues and so on and i think that is the only way that we can really get meaningful change and lift our own consciousness and that of those around us and i think that is the way that eventually politics can change and hopefully we can get enough people getting into politics that actually raise their own consciousness and if i am to label the topic and bring that into the last lecture here by the brahma kumari center which is what which was change using your role in society to transform society and actually if we recall those who were here the main stuff of graceness with your presence and being part of today's proceedings with that as we started we'd like to end with a meditation session led by sister himlata